Wow. Dad, look what, look what Santa brought me. It's what I wanted. Santa? Yeah, I put it on my Christmas letter and he got it for me because he's real. Santa Costoru, a homanada, wa arimasin. Not of our kind of shonen. talk about lies. I saw this crazy story on TikTok. There's a guy named Eric Decker. He decided he was going to pull a prank on the internet and see if he could get people to believe him. So him and his buddy, they went to the airport in LA, LAX. They filmed a bunch of footage of just the airplanes and the hangers and all that stuff. Then they created a CGI version of his face they made a green screen, put it in their garage. They did all of this stuff to make him look like he had a jetpack. Then they paid somebody to make the footage look real. So they took him on his jetpack in his garage and they made a video and it looked like he was flying through the air <laughs> in LAX. He puts it on Reddit. It starts getting a bunch of upvotes. People are watching it. People are like, what is going on? And then news stations start talking about it. There's a guy on a jetpack flying around. I remember when the story broke and I was like, dude, they've got Rocketeer out here, like for real. The local news channel tracks him down and wants to interview him because they're the ones who had the footage. So they're interviewed on the news and he's like, yeah, I 100% am sure I saw someone on a jetpack. And then just recently they're like, hey, everybody, it was a prank. And everybody fell for it. <laughs> I just think it's funny how like the news who we trust that are supposed to do a good job. Like how did they not check this out? Supposedly two pilots at the airport confirmed that they saw Jetpack Man. Who are these pilots? They were completely lying. There was no Jetpack. There's a lot of things wrong with that story. First off, let me give props to these dudes because that's hilarious. They wanted to show how easy it is to manipulate the media and you guys did it. Congrats. Secondly, shame on you news channels. You guys are awful. Like your whole job is supposed to give us the facts and basically you ran a story about a guy's fake YouTube video. Thirdly, shame on all of us because we believed a lie. Now I know it's kind of not our fault because you know we try to supposedly trust the news. Unless you're me. And you know the Illuminati runs media. <laughs> no, but seriously, I don't trust the news. But we like to believe lies. Another YouTube channel, they found a Justin Bieber lookalike and they hired him. They actually flew him down to LA from Canada. They hired him to take a picture where he was eating a burrito sideways. And the picture went viral and people were like, whoa, Justin Bieber doesn't know how to eat a burrito. It was kind of funny, but it was just a prank. But it just shows you that we're easily deceived. Human beings, as amazing as we are, and I do believe that we're pretty amazing. We're made in God's own image. That being said, we're pretty gullible. So I just Googled lies that the government tells us people, and they were all super depressing, so I'm not gonna talk about them. We get lied to a lot by a lot of different people. And we oftentimes fall for those lies. But today I want to talk about when the devil lies to us. I just want to talk about four different lies the devil has told us that we sometimes fall for. The devil is called the father of lies. He's good at this. One of the first things that he did when he interacted with mankind was he deceived us. He was with Eve in the garden. He told lies about the fruit that they weren't supposed to eat. 
and it had grave consequences for not only Adam and Eve, but literally all of humanity. So the first lie I want to talk about is this. Some people say the world is so wicked and scary, it's impossible for a Christian to live a peaceful, happy, joyous life. And that's not true. So a couple things I want to say. First off, in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, the Bible has a great verse about what our spirit is supposed to be. And it says that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. We have a spirit of confidence. We have a spirit of charity, being able to love and get along with the people in this world. And we have a spirit of a sound mind, which is self-control. We can do what we're supposed to do to please God. I don't think it's healthy for us to go through life being scared as Christians of a president, of a government, of society, of school, being able to shut down our faith. Nothing can shut down our faith. Faith is something you possess within yourself. No one can take that away from you. People have faced much harder persecution and criticism and suffering because of their faith than we do in America in 2020. I know it's not super popular to be a Christian. I know it offends a lot of people that we believe the Word of God, that we believe in Jesus, that we believe in a heaven and a hell, that we believe that some things are sinful, that God has not put the stamp of approval on everything we humans have decided to do. That is extremely offensive to some people. However, Christians have suffered way worse in the past. If you look in the book of Acts and you look at the early church, I'm talking about Jesus was here, he died, was resurrected, went back to heaven, and he's like, okay guys, it's on you, get going. Those guys went through it. Before Jesus left, he talked to Peter and he said, hey, you're going to be crucified like I was crucified, buddy. Like it didn't end well for a lot of those guys. Apostle Paul, that guy got his head chopped off. A bunch of the early church leaders suffered death because of their faith. And if we're going to be honest, we don't really face that too much in our country. Now, there are other places in the world where that happens. There are places like North Korea. There are places like China, communist China, where you're not allowed to openly live your faith. And those people have suffered true persecution. But what's amazing is how Christianity is flourishing in these countries that are facing tremendous pressure and true persecution. Because the gospel, because Jesus is greater and stronger than anything else in this world. The Bible says, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. If God be for us, who can be against us? What do we have to fear? We shouldn't live our life afraid of the consequences of living for God. We should live boldly in our faith. Jesus said, I will be with you always, even to the end of the world. I also really want to bring to light our Christian brothers and sisters who are suffering around the globe, like genuinely suffering and giving their life sometimes for their faith. These people are incredible. These are people who are literally sacrificing everything for their faith in Christ. And so if we're a little scared or we're a little bothered because the guy at Starbucks doesn't say Merry Christmas, we need to get over that stuff. We really do. We shouldn't be living afraid that someone's going to make being a Christian harder. It's always been like that. And if we're very honest, it's not that hard for us here in America. We had church on Sunday and nobody came and tried to arrest us because we were preaching the Bible. So let's not pretend like we are these victims when we really aren't. All right, the second lie. Now that you are saved, now that you've been born again, now that you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are free to sin as much as you want. That's not true. 
So we get this thing kind of twisted in our head that we are free to sin. And we're not free to sin. We are free from sin. Romans chapter 6 is a wonderful chapter, and I want to challenge you to read the entire thing. It says this in the first two verses. It says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? So he's saying, so what are we supposed to do? Oh, I have all this grace covering my sin. Well, let me just keep on sinning so that way I can experience even more grace. <laughs> he says, by no means. How can we who die to sin still live in it? We have died to sin. Like sin does not have reign over us, doesn't have authority over us anymore. So why in the world would we continue to live in it? Verses 15 through 18 are also super good. I'm going to read them to you right now. It says, what then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? So he says, are we supposed to live in sin because we don't suffer the penalty of the law? If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your savior, you are no longer under the penalty of the law. He saves you from your sins and from hell. So then are we supposed to just sin because we don't have that penalty anymore? That's the question. And again, he says, by no means. It's like, no, you shouldn't do that. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey? So if I go and I show up and some guy's got a farm and I say, look, I am here to work. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. I have become his servant. I presented myself as his servant. And Apostle Paul is making a point here, and he's saying, look, if you present yourself as a servant to sin, then sin is your master. So he says this, as I continue, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. So he said, you guys have decided after you've been saved, after you heard the truth, to no longer serve sin while you're in this fleshly body, but to serve righteousness. You became obedient and that obedience is going to become righteousness in your life. Yes, does Jesus save you from your sin? He does. Is there anything that we can do or need to do in order to um, save ourselves? No, we're saved by faith. We're saved by grace. He did all the heavy lifting. We have to believe on him, John 3, 16. But that doesn't mean that we're supposed to live our life just continuing in sin because we have a free pass. In fact, if that's how you looked at salvation, oh, I'm going to say this prayer and now I get to do whatever. I think you might have some issues there. That's not what it's about. If you've accepted Christ and now Christ is indwelling in you, he is supposed to be living through you. Your life is supposed to be a testimony of him and what he's doing. If we continue in sin, that's not a good testimony. If we continue in sin, that's not him working in our life. That's us being disobedient. And I want you to understand this concept that you think sin is just fun and you get to do whatever you want. And don't get me wrong. The Bible does say there's pleasure in sin for a season. But it's kind of like Stockholm Syndrome. Have you ever heard of Stockholm Syndrome? It's where somebody gets kidnapped. And it's a psychological thing that happens in people's brain. But basically the kidnappee, the person that is captive, looks at their captor, their kidnapper, as now like a paternal or like loving relationship. Like they look at them and they say, oh, I'm attached this, to this person emotionally now. It's crazy. I feel like many of us, because we've lived in sin for so long and we're not captive to it anymore, but we still have affection in our heart for it. We experience spiritual Stockholm Syndrome. If you look at salvation as, well, I still get to sin, then you're weirdly attached to your former slave master, who was not a good master. 
Satan and the flesh and sin beat us up in life. Why would we want a free pass to serve them? We've been freed from them, so now we can serve God. Line number three, the Bible is outdated. The Bible was written thousands of years ago. It doesn't apply to me now. I don't need it. What can something that was written by Moses 4,000 years ago and then by these New Testament guys 2,000 years ago, what could that possibly have for me today in 2020? We have the internet now. We have technology. We have cars. We're flying to space. We have all kinds of crazy stuff. There's no way that that book written then applies to us now. Well, I just think that that's wrong. So let me give you an example. God gave us 10 rules in the book of Exodus, the big 10, the 10 commandments, right? He says, you shouldn't worship other gods. Don't make any idols. I'm your only God. But then he also gives some real practical rules for human beings. And let's see how well we are dealing with those today. One of those rules is thou shalt not kill. You shouldn't murder people. Now in 2017, almost half a million people were murdered worldwide. 464,000 people were involved in a homicide. All right, so maybe we haven't figured that one out yet. Maybe we still need to listen to the Bible. The Bible says also in the Big Ten, the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not steal. I think a great example that we still haven't figured this out is the unfortunate riots of the 2020 summer. So George Floyd uh, lost his life at the hands of Minneapolis police. It was a messed up situation and people got mad about it, like really mad. And so there was protests, but those protests got out of hand and it turned into rioting. And the rioting turned into looting. There is a picture on the internet in the Minneapolis Target People are destroying cash registers. It's like the end of the world. Looks like zombie apocalypse happened. And there's this dude walking out of Target and he was looting a Lego set. <laughs> like how brave is that guy? <laughs> it's like there is a worldwide pandemic. There are race riots. And he's like, I'm going to go get my Legos. A lot of people this summer used the protest as an excuse to do what they wanted to do. And what they wanted to do was to destroy stuff and to steal. So does thou shalt not steal apply to 2020? Yeah, it does. We still haven't figured out we shouldn't take things that don't belong to us. I remember one time at the church, someone stole like memory out of a computer. Like they had to open up a computer and they stole the memory. From it that happened at church so people still steal we still need the Bible to give us instruction because we're not listening to it and we're hurting ourselves so I think it's kind of silly of us to say that the Bible is not relevant when even today it is still addressing issues that we deal with that we have not conquered yet and then number four the last lie that we're gonna talk about the last lie the devil tells us is you have ignored God for so long, he doesn't want you back. That's a lie. Jesus tells this story in Luke chapter 15. It's the story of the prodigal son. It starts in verse 11. It goes to verse 32. It's one of my favorite parables that Jesus spoke. And basically, there's two sons. One is we'll call good He's got his issues, don't get me wrong, but for the sake of the story, we're just gonna say he's the good one, right? And one of them's kinda bad. So the younger brother, the bad one, says, hey man, dad, give me the money that I'm supposed to inherit. He just wants his cash. Doesn't wanna wait for his dad to die. He's just like, give me the money now, and let me do what I want with it. So the dad says, okay. So he leaves and he goes out, and becomes a party animal. And he's living in a far country, he becomes a party animal, spends all his money, as soon as he spends all his money, all his friends are gone because they only wanted to be his friend because he had money. So he's working on this like pig farmer's property and he's over there and the guy wouldn't even give him food to eat. So he's eating like the pig food. 
that's nasty. So this guy's eating pig feed and he's like, I can go back to my dad and I can beg him and say, dad, can I just be like a servant for you? And at least I'll have food. So he comes back to see his dad. Now we're thinking in our head, the dad's probably going to be mad because he was a jerk when he left or this or that. But the Bible says that the dad was waiting there. He was looking and he saw the son from afar off. So he's kind of waiting on the porch. The dad sees him from super far away and he doesn't just go and say, all right, I'm just going to wait here and see what he has to say. That's how we would act, but that's not how that dad act. He went and he ran to the son and the Bible says he kissed him on his neck. He was just so happy to see him. One of the biggest points of that whole story is that when we get away from God, when we come back to him, that's his heart. That's, he's just waiting for us. The Bible says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. If you get close to God, he's going to get close to you. He wants to have a relationship with you. Even if you've been far from him for a long time, if you haven't prayed all year, he's just sitting there waiting for you to pray, lovingly, hoping. He wants to hear your voice. He wants you to pray. Psalm 51 is a psalm that David wrote after he committed a incredible sin, like a very bad set of sins. Not just one sin, it was like multiple things. It was really, really awful. And it's like the repentant psalm. It's him just pouring out his heart and saying, I messed up and I want to be restored unto God. Verses 16 and 17 are great verses, and it says this, For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. He said, he said, I would give you the sacrifices if you wanted it, but that's not really what you're after. He said, Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. God is not going to turn you away when you're offering your heart to him. When you're opening up and you're saying, God, I'm trying to reconnect with you. That is what he has been waiting for. That's truly what he wants. He doesn't want you just to get back in line and do all the church type things that you're supposed to do. He wants your heart. If he gets your heart, you'll do the things that he wants you to do anyways. He loves you very much and he wants to reconnect with you. And if you have not prayed in a while, don't let the devil deceive you into thinking that God is going to be frustrated. God's not going to be happy when you come back to him. No, he's going to be very happy. Talk to God. All right. So there are a ton of lies out there. There's a guy jetpacking at LAX. Justin Bieber doesn't know how to eat a burrito. And the devil likes to tell even more powerful lies that are truly harmful to us and to our walk with God. And so don't believe those lies. All right. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you next time.